Hey everybody, uh, this is Aaron Gallagher from the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Um, I posted something last night, so we're going to do a live video. Uh, if you're seeing this live, you're on Instagram. If you're seeing it recorded on YouTube, uh, that's because every video that we take, we film here on Instagram. Uh, a lot of them we will then screen record and put onto YouTube. So uh, I know I got a, in my questions, uh, Joel uh, said, hey, I don't want to miss it. Can you wait till this weekend? Uh, if you watch the video and you are like, hey, I'm on my phone, I want to watch it, um, in a more uh, a slower version where you can pause it and you go back. We put all these videos on YouTube, so just message us and it will give you the YouTube link. Um, so I posted the video last night that we were going to do a video on the doctrine, uh, the teaching. All right, doctrine just means teaching. Once saved, always saved. Uh, sometimes people call it perseverance of the saints. Um, and this is something that a lot of people have never heard of. Uh, if you go to a church, um, like a community church, most likely uh, you're, you're probably, your leaders will teach this, even if you don't really know that they do. A lot of Baptist churches teach this, um, Presbyterians. Um, it, it all is really kind of a part of a uh, bigger doctrine uh, along called Calvinism. Uh, people call it Calvinism because John Calvin was one of the big proponents of it. Um, and so we're going to talk about really what the Bible says. So if, if you... Um, Right off the bat, say, I don't like this video because I go to a church like that. Don't click off. Just watch through it. Um, if you can show me that what I'm teaching is not the truth, I will change in a heartbeat. Um, I want to know the truth and to follow God as is revealed through the Bible, His Word. Um, so if you can change my mind, you'll be my best friend. So if you disagree with me, that's fine. I, people disagree with me all the time. Ask my wife. Uh, I'm just kidding. My wife's great. Um, but if you disagree with me, that's fine. I'm not going to get worked up. You can send me a message. I do private studies over Instagram, telephone, whatever we have to do um, if you're in a country here in the U.S. or anywhere in the world. So let's go ahead and, and hop right into it. Uh, we do have 14 questions we're going to try to get to at the end. Um, we'll try to work through them pretty quickly. I might have to do a different video. Um, but, okay, can you lose your salvation? What do I mean by that? Um, some people will teach that once you're truly saved, okay, so that's a whole nother uh, conversation, how you get truly saved. We talked about that in some of the other videos. But once you're saved, we're assuming that you are saved. Can you ever lose that? Um, I want to read you some things that, uh, that I have written in my Bible from studies I've done before. This is the standard manual for Baptist churches, okay? Uh, in the standard manual for Baptist churches, and I'm going to summarize, I'm not going to read it word for word, but uh, such that are truly regenerate, born of the Spirit, that means saved, will not fall away and perish, but will endure till the end. So sometimes you'll hear people say, well, it's once saved, always saved, but if you see somebody who is attending church and you think they're saved and later they fall away, they'll say, well, they were never saved in the first place, okay? Um, you know, I actually, somebody shared a video on my Facebook asking me to watch a video recently, and this video recently was by a teacher named Charles Stanley. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. But in his video, he said, never means never. So if he says, if you're saved, you'll never fall away. Okay, I disagree because the scriptures teach that that's not right. Um, if you like Charles, Charles Stanley, nothing against the guy. I'm sure he's got a great heart. Um, but unfortunately, I'm going to stick with the word of God, and we're going to look at that today. If you disagree, don't click off the video. Let's watch it. And this is the verse, one of the verses that Charles Stanley went to. He went to the book of John, chapter 10, and he quoted this. And I give them, this is John 10, 28, and I give them, okay, them, followers of Christ, eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And he even said in his video, never means never, okay? So he said, those that I give them eternal life, they have eternal life, and that they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand, okay? A lot of times when you read a verse like that, you don't want to read just one verse. Try to read the whole section because a lot of false teachings, the verse before it or after it or a couple verses before it or after it will completely clear up the passage, right? So I want to read you the verse right before it, all right? This is verse 26. Jesus said to them, uh, verse 26, But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. And I said to you, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Then comes verse 28, and I give them eternal life. The them is pointing back to the sheep who follow Jesus. And they shall never perish, okay? Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand, all right? So first of all, you have to be following Jesus in order. That's a continual thing. Uh, we'll look at another verse here in a second. You have to be continually following Jesus for you, for you to have eternal life, okay? Um, one of the things that a lot of the newer translations uh 
leave out is this idea of continually following. For instance, one of the, the um, passages that he went to in this lesson, he went to John 3, right? And he, I'll read you this verse. Uh, let me find it. John 3, uh, he read, He who believes in him is not condemned, all right? But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. So he'll go to the first part of that verse and say, He who believes is not condemned. He said, okay, I'm a believer. I'm not condemned. Well, the King James, let me read this in the King James. And here's why, right? Nothing wrong with the new King James, which is what I'm reading from here. King James is great. It's got some problems with it, not major ones. I would recommend King James, new King James, uh, ASV. Um, that's what I'll recommend for right now. For God so loved the world, that's John 3, 16, okay? Two verses later, for he that believeth, John 3, 18. When you see an E-T-H in the King James, believeth, doeth, right? It's a continuous action. Why does it have E-T-H? Well, in Greek, John 3, 18, he who believeth, uh, believes, believes is a present participle. What that means is someone that continues to believe, all right? So if you are saved and you continue to believe, yeah, then you're saved. What if you stop believing, okay? Because that's normally what people leave out of the equation. If you're following God, that's great, okay? If you're saved according to what the New Testament teaches, that's great. But if you stop following that, what happens, all right? I want to look at a couple, a couple passages. Think about this as we go through these. Some people will say that you, if you're saved, you can never fall away. I want to read you something that Paul said. I'm sure you've heard of him if you've read the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, all right? In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I want to read you what Paul, okay? The Apostle Paul, the, the, maybe the greatest, pre other than, of course, Jesus himself, one of the greatest preachers and evangelists of all time. Here's what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Okay, it's verse 26. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul. But I discipline my body and bring it to subjection, lest when I, that's Paul, have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Some versions say a castaway. Now, I got a question for you. If the Apostle Paul, right, who's writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that's John 16, 13, okay, John 14, 26, Jesus said the Holy Spirit would guide the apostles into all truth, okay? If Paul's writing by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's God, Acts 5, then what Paul writes is directly from God. And the Bible says, according to Paul, that Paul was worried that if he didn't keep it up, that whenever uh, he, when he preached to others, he himself, Paul, could become disqualified or cast away. Now, here's a question for you. If Paul was worried and that he could become a castaway, should you not be worried? I'm worried, okay? Now, not in the sense of my guilt just eats me up every day, okay? But in the idea that I know, according to the scriptures, that I have to keep following God, okay? Because if Paul could become a castaway, and Paul knows what he's talking about, okay? Then I could become a castaway, okay? Uh, to stop following is, quite the, qu is quitting your relationship. That's true, okay? If you are a Christian and you stop following God, all right, then you're going to run into some big problems in Scripture. And yes, you can lose your salvation, okay? Let me, I, I don't want you to just take my word for it, okay? If you disagree, don't leave the video yet. Let's watch. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, that's great. This is live on Instagram. If you're watching on Instagram, we put the videos on YouTube so you can watch there as well. Okay, let's look at some other, uh, some other passages. Um, Let's go to 1 Corinthians 5, and here's why I want to show you this. 1 Corinthians 5 is an example of what's called church discipline, okay? This is something that a lot of churches don't practice. Uh, hey, Ford, uh, I can't pronounce some of the names, sorry guys, but uh, everyone in the video, I'm glad you're here. So if you have your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians 5. If you don't have your Bible, this will be on YouTube. You can watch it later and look up your Bible. In 1 Corinthians 5, you have a situation. Now remember, 1 Corinthians is written to the church in Corinth. These people are already Christians, and he's writing to the church. And Paul, in chapter 5, is giving a situation where there is a man, I'll read it to you, uh, 1 Corinthians 5.1. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. There was a man at this church who had his father's wife, and it says in verse 2, and you're puffed up, all right? Why would they be puffed up and prideful? Probably because they say, look how forgiving, look how tolerant we are. This man has his father's wife, but we're proud that we're still allowing him to come to worship. All right, here's what Paul says, okay? You are puffed up and have not mourned that he who has done this might be taken away from you. And Paul says this in verse 3. 
For I indeed as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, though I was present with him has done this deed. Okay? So there's a man who has his father's wife. Paul, 1 Corinthians 5, you know what Paul says? I've judged this guy already, and I'm not even there. I'm just writing a letter. I've heard about this. And this guy, I'm judging him already. And here is why Paul says you're supposed to put this man out away from you, okay? Verse, if you skip over 1 Corinthians 5, verse, uh, let's see, 13. But those who are outside God judges, therefore put away from yourselves this evil person. He says, this guy who has his father's wife, you need to get him out of the church. Why? Because a little sin, uh, I can see his comment, I'll hang, handle that in a second. Legalistic, That we're going to explain what that means, um, because that comment there is kind of mixing some, th- some concepts together. Okay, Paul says, put away the evil person from your midst. Why? Why do you need to put somebody out of the church if they're not living according to what the Bible says, okay? Here's why. Verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan. Why? For the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Let's connect some dots. Paul says, this guy in 1 Corinthians 5 is in this awful sin. He's already a Christian, okay? He's a member of the church. Put him away from you. Why put him away? So that his soul may be saved, all right? So what he's saying is you need to do this to this man to get him to repent, okay? If you become a Christian and you go off into the sin and you won't repent of it, then you're in the danger of losing your salvation. When does that happen? The Bible doesn't tell us exactly when that point is. Christ is the judge. Let's deal with one of these comments here. Faith is not legalistic. Okay, first of all, when someone says legalism, that term gets thrown around like a football today, okay? Legalism. People will try to make you teach that the Bible says that legalism is a bad thing, and it is only in one sense, right? If your definition of legalism is trying to keep all of God's commandments, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? What legalism is condemned, like in the Bible with the Pharisees, is when they made their own laws and told people to follow them as if they were God's laws, okay? Jesus never condemned the Pharisees for trying to keep all of the commandments, okay? What Jesus condemned the Pharisees for is being hypocritical. Now, let me give you a passage for that. Go to Matthew, if you have your Bible, Matthew 23, 23, okay? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith, okay? But listen to the rest of the verse. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone, okay? Jesus didn't say to the Pharisees, hey, you're neglecting the big things and you're keeping the small things, get rid of the small things and only keep the big things. He said you should keep the small things and you should have also kept the big things, okay? Uh, We're going down through these. I'm moving back up. Salvation is through grace, that's God's part, through faith, our part, you're saved. Absolutely. You can lose your salvation, all right? That is something, if you're, if you're out there and you've been taught you cannot lose it, let me explain this to you. You did not get that from the Bible. Your leaders did not get that from the Bible. I don't mean to upset you, okay? If, if I make you mad, I'm sorry. But I'm trying to share the truth with you. That does not contradict anything Jesus did on the cross for us. I'll read you a passage, okay? If you say that we can't fall away, I want to read you something. i got plenty of passages to go to, but let's just go to Hebrews. I want to read you what you... If you walk away from Christ, if you live a life of sin and you don't repent of it, I want to read you what the Bible says about that. Let's go to Hebrews 10. I'm going to read 20, verse 26. This is straight out of Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. It's a long passage, but I want you to hear what the writer of Hebrews said to Christians, Hebrews, okay, they're Christians, Hebrew Christians, about what they did if they left Christianity and went back into a life of sin or back to the law of Moses. Therefore, now verse 26, If we, who's we, Christians, sin willfully after we've received a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which devour the adversaries. Verse 29. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counting the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing? This says, if you receive the knowledge of the truth, if you've been sanctified, that means saved, okay? You set apart, okay? You haven't been sanctified by the blood if you haven't been saved. So these are saved people. And he says, if you receive, uh, if you sin willfully and you don't repent of it, then there no longer remains a sacrifice. Uh, Insulted the spirit of grace, okay? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. It says that you actually trampled the Son of God underfoot, okay? You can lose your salvation if you walk away from God, okay? 
Um, we are Jesus' children is very dangerous. Yes, but to lose your salvation, you need to try so hard. You need to be against God. Don't follow him because he's merciful. Yeah, God is merciful, all right? Uh, I don't know what you mean by you don't have to try so hard. If you are living a life of sin and you won't repent of it, that, that sin will keep you out. God forgives sin if you are truly saved, and that's another topic, okay? If you are truly saved and whenever you repent of your sin, that's when your sin is forgiven. I'll give you an example of that. Let's go to the book of 1 John, okay? If I go too fast, these videos are all on, um, on YouTube, okay? Uh, I know I talk fairly fast. I'm, I try to slow down. 1 John, okay? 1 John chapter 1, written to Christians. Here is what the Bible says, how a Christian stays forgiven of sins. Um, verse 6, if we say, now notice verse 6 through 10 of 1 John chapter 1, all of these start with if, okay? It's an if-then statement. If you do this, then. Okay? So if you give me $10, then I will do this. Now, what if you don't give me $10? Well, then I'm not going to do this. That's how an if-then agreement works. Verse 6 of 1 John chapter 1. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, that means live in a life of sin, we lie and do not practice, practice the truth. Verse 7. If we walk in the light, walking means your way, your manner of life. If we walk in the light as he, Christ, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If you're a Christian and you continue following God to the best of your ability, when you sin, you fall short, you repent, God forgives you. If you're walking in the light, doing your best, the blood of Christ cleanses you from all sin. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're a Christian and you sin. You confess that sin. You repent of it. You pray. Acts 8 tells us that story of Simon the sorcerer. Peter told him to, after he'd sinned, he'd been baptized, okay? He's culminated. He's saved. Then he sins. What happens? Peter says, pray. He doesn't say, be baptized again. He says, pray. Whenever he prayed, that the thought and the intent of your heart may be forgiven you, okay? If you're a Christian, whenever you sin, you repent, Okay, that means you basically feel bad about what you've done. You should have godly sorrow. That godly sorrow should lead you to repentance, confess your sin to God, and pray. That's how a Christian has his sins forgiven. Okay, That's not how you're saved initially. Okay, That's different. Um, all right, I'm getting a lot of questions. Uh, Genesis 3.15, I'm going to add that to my list to handle later, um, just because we're going to stay on topic. Um, everything is allowed, not everything is good. Well, the, the context of that is everything that isn't against God's commandments. There, that's in the context. There are certain things like meat offered to idols, Romans 14. Uh, if something is offered to an idol, but it offends your brother, you shouldn't do it. That's different. It's not everything is not allowed. Drug, hard drugs are not allowed under Christianity. Okay. So not everything is allowed that you got to get that in context. Okay, good. So we're caught back up. So we got off topic a little bit. But we're going to look at some passages that show you can lose your salvation. Now, here's what I'm saying. The way to know, we just read 1 John, the way to keep your salvation is to continue to follow God, all right? Study, you're supposed to grow in, as, as a Christian, okay? Grow in your knowledge of the New Testament. When you first become a Christian, you're not going to know everything, okay? Be patient, let the Word, and when I say the Word, I mean this book, the Bible, be your guide, okay? Um, if you like to read, that's great. I'm going to recommend you get back to reading the New Testament and the Old Testament, okay? The Old Testament was written for our learning also. I'm going to tell you to shy away from all these books written by humans. Uh, why? Because on Judgment Day, this is what's going to judge you, okay? You're not going to be judged by John Calvin's Institutes uh, of, uh, or Religious Theology books. Why? Because there's a lot of stuff in there that's completely contradictory to the New Testament, okay? And the Old Testament. Um, that's one of the things we're dealing with. Here, um, Calvinism. Uh, if you've heard Tulip, all right, Tulip. T. We're not under the law. We're not under the law of Moses. That passage you're pulling out of context. We are under grace. That's correct. But the the law of Christ, Galatians six. Let's get now. I'll just show you. I'm going to quote these things really quickly, and no one's going to listen to them. If I go to Galatians, um, Galatians, we can look at the law of Christ. If I go to Romans, I go to Romans eight. You know why not go to Romans eight? I like that one. Everybody likes the book of Romans. Speaking of Christians, the whole purpose of Romans, uh, a lot of teaching in Romans is about how the Jews who were trying to keep the law of Moses were not justified by the law of Moses, but you were justified by 
faith in Christ, okay? The system of faith, not just simple belief. Uh, let's see, here we go. Um, Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ, okay? That's the gospel, all right? So when you say we're under grace, but I'm not under, or we're not under the law, but under grace, well, yeah, but grace is still has terms and laws. It doesn't mean you can just do whatever you want to do, okay? You just started to read the Bible. That's fantastic, man. Way to go. Uh, studying the book of James. I love the book of James. Okay, so we're hopping around. I want to read you some more uh, passages, okay? Um, the book of Hebrews is one of the purposes is to show the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, okay, that have become Christians, don't go back to the law of Moses, okay? Why? Because they were facing a lot of persecution in the first century, and there was a big temptation for them to go back to the law of Moses, all right? Because the Jews, if you read the book of Acts, you'll see the Jews persecuted people a lot. I want to read you uh, two more sections of Hebrews. Why? Because the topic today is, can you fall from grace? Can you lose your salvation? I want to read you some more passages and let you hear what the scriptures say. Hebrews chapter 3, okay? I'm going to read you this. Verse 12, Hebrews 3.12. Hebrews is written to Christians. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you, brethren, Christians, any of you, Christians, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Okay, we talked about this in John 10. Nobody can snatch you out of God's hand. If I'm a Christian and I'm being faithful, nobody can take me, snatch me away from God. Romans 8, uh, no one can separate me from the love of Christ. If I am being faithful to Christ, then nobody can pull me away from that. He even gives a list of tribulation, sword. None of these things can separate me, right? But what if you choose to walk away from God, okay? That's what it says here in Hebrews 3. Beware, brethren, Christians, Lest there be in any of you, Christians, brethren, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You can depart and walk away from the law of God. But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you, Christians, be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. Once again, Christians, Christians, Christians. If we hold, if we hold to the beginning of our confidence. Okay. I'm holding to this pen, right? What if I let it go, right? I don't have it anymore. It's the same way with salvation, okay? Uh, I have kept all those you have given me. Okay, you want to talk about John? Let's go to the book of John. This is something that people who uh, hold to a Calvinist teaching, which is Calvinist total depravity means you're born in sin, you can't do anything, okay? That's incorrect, okay? Um, I can give you plenty of passages that show you're not born in sin. Jeremiah 19, 4 and 5 says children, they were offering their children to these false gods, innocent, okay? Um, if you don't know what Calvinism is, uh, oh, okay, good. All right, sorry, official coach, you agree. Sorry, I thought you were talking about uh, that you can turn. That's right. You can turn and leave and walk away from God. Okay, I got a little worked up, and he wasn't even saying the same thing I thought he was saying. Um, let's go to John 6, though, just because if you're studying with somebody, um, you are going to encounter these passages, okay? So I want to give you some examples of some passages that they will take you to. Um, Let's go to John 6. Let's go to John 6. Hmm. All right, let's go to John 6.45. This is something that, um, that, that people will take you to. This is an idea some people will take you to if they're teaching Calvinism, that you cannot follow God. All right, here's what Calvinism teaches. It's Remember the word tulip. That's how they teach it. Total depravity, which means you're born sinful. Adam's sin is reckoned to us, original sin. We can't do anything good, Okay. The second point is unconditional election. Now, I'm going to break it down very simply what they teach. God made some people that are going to heaven no matter what and some people that are going to hell no matter what. Guess what? That's not right either. All these are false. Limited atonement, okay? That means they don't believe Jesus died for everybody. They believe that Jesus only died for the elect, okay? That's not true either. I can show you plenty of passages that says Jesus died for everybody. Uh, the I in TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, I stands for irresistible grace, okay? People that teach this say that if God gives you his grace, that you cannot refuse it, okay? That there's nothing you can do, okay? Let me, let me pause one dilemma to that, okay? Look in uh, this book, Titus, okay? 2.11, I want to read you this. I want to read you their, teach their teaching. Their teaching is that you have, God's grace is irresistible, meaning if he gives it to you, you can't resist it, you're automatically saved, nothing you can do about it. Because you're totally depraved, you have to obey it. Here's a problem. Titus 2.11 says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, okay, wait a minute, 
Titus 2.11 says the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Well, if when God gives you the grace, it's irresistible and you're saved, then this says that God's grace came to all men. So that would mean, according to their own doctrine, that all men are going to be saved. We know the New Testament doesn't teach that. We know that the Bible says in Matthew 7, 14 and 15 that the way to heaven is narrow, okay? And the way to destruction, to hell, is wide. There's going to be many that find it, okay? Well, let's read Titus 2, 11 and verse 12 because normally the next verse gives you insight. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, verse 12, teaching us. Okay, how does God's grace teach you? Right here, okay? God's grace sent Christ, okay? He sent Christ to come to the earth, right, and to teach, okay? And then when Christ said he was going to leave after the resurrection, he went to the cross, right, shed his blood, which is what forgives our sins. I don't want anybody to think that I don't think Christ's blood is what forgives our sins. Absolutely, it's the only thing. Jesus Christ is the only thing that makes us able to become in the presence of God is his sacrifice for us, okay? So, Jesus, after he was crucified, death, burial, resurrection, spends 40 days with his disciples, and he teaches them, he's going to send, this is John 14 through 17, he's going to send the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles into all truth. Be careful when you're reading John 14 through 17 that you don't take things written to the apostles and apply it to me. For instance, some people will say, I don't need anybody to teach me because the Holy Spirit guides me into all truth. You're not an apostle. He didn't, uh, he didn't lead you into all truth, okay? Jude 3 says the truth had been, the faith had been once delivered for all, okay? Jude 3, first century, all the truth, all the faith, that was far as the New Testament scriptures had been delivered. I'm going very fast. Okay, let's, we've got a long comment, so I'm, I'm, we're going to, uh, okay, we're going to see what the comment is. Okay, uh, abides. You cannot tell people they're going to lose their salvation. Are you the Holy Spirit? No, I'm not the Holy Spirit, but this is the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, okay? The Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God. I'm telling you what the Bible says, okay? Uh, the Bible says that a person can lose their salvation if they fall away from God, okay? Uh, let's see. Telling people not to read earthly human books. You shouldn't be teaching. No, I'm, I actually am telling you that you should be reading this. If you're reading books written by men that are not inspired, you're going to be misled. The Bible is the only book that is inspired by God, okay? So I'm not even going to deal with the rest of this comment um, because somebody who is telling me that the Holy Spirit gave me the New Testament. So when I show you what the New Testament says, this is the Holy Spirit speaking, okay? The Holy Spirit does not speak to you today in some way that contradicts the Bible. If the Holy Spirit or your somebody is telling you the Holy Spirit says you can't lose your salvation... I'm showing you the Holy Spirit says you can lose your salvation through the words of the Bible. So one of them's lying, and I'm going to stick with the Bible, and the person telling you that you can't lose it, think about this. If I'm the devil, okay, I'm not the devil, if I was the devil, you know what I would want you to think? I would want you to think there's no way you could lose your salvation. Why? Because if you can't lose your salvation, then what do you think? If you can't lose your salvation, then... The devil would, I mean, the, the devil wants you to think that, all right? The devil wants you to think, uh, Jasher, oh yeah, sorry, I'll get to that in a second. The devil wants you to think you can't lose your salvation. Why? So that you'll go out and live this life of sin thinking, oh, I, I can never lose my salvation. So when something tempts you, you're not going to say, oh, I can't go down that road, okay? Um, so let's go to some more passages. Uh, I read Hebrews 6. Uh, let's go to a simple one in Galatians 5, okay? Galatians 5. I think makes it very clearly. People will tell you that you cannot fall from grace. Galatians 5, I want to read you this. Indeed, I, Paul, say that if you become circumcised, I'm starting in verse 2 because I want you to understand this is talking about works of the law of Moses. This is not talking about things that you do as a Christian obeying God's commands. People will go to this or Romans and take it out of context and say, we're not justified by works, therefore we don't have any works we have to do, you don't have to do anything. False. That's not at all in context. That is out of context. In context, verse 2, Galatians 5, Paul, I say that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. He is teaching these people that the law of Moses has been done away with, okay, and now you're under the law of Christ, okay? You can call it whatever you want, the gospel of Christ, the faith of Christ, the faith is a system, okay? In verse 3, 
I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised, he is a debtor to keep the whole law. If you try to keep one part of the law of Moses, you got to keep the whole thing, okay? You have become estranged from Christ. You, Christians, you've become estranged from Christ. If you're attempting to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Can I fall off of a building if I'm not on the top of a building? No. This is so simple, guys. I don't mean to, if, if, if I'm disagreeing with something that you fundamentally believe, I'm sorry, okay? But the truth is, if I'm on top of a building, then I can fall off it. If you are under grace, okay, if you are a Christian, you can fall from that grace. How? By stopping following God, by trying to be justified by the law of Moses, okay? By trying to be justified by God, things that God did not give us, okay? When you try to do that, you can fall from grace. You can't fall from grace if you were never under grace, okay? Um, Romans 5, oh, I'll, I'll show you one more. Romans 5 talks about how you have access to that grace, all right? Let's we'll go to Romans 5. If you have your Bible, great. If you don't, you're watching on Instagram, I'll say this many times, you can then um, look up on, uh, in, uh, shoot, YouTube, okay? Go to YouTube, um, and you can watch these videos later when you have your Bible. Romans 5, 1, therefore... Okay. Remember, when you see therefore, I want you to ask yourself the question, what is it therefore? That means when you see the word therefore, it's calling you back to something he just talked about. You know, If I said, this is why, etc., 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 therefore this. Okay. So, Romans 5, therefore, he's talking about referring back to chapter 4, which is talking about Abraham not being justified by circumcision. Why? Or the law of Moses? Because Abraham was before the law of Moses. Okay. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory. Sorry, I skipped a line. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, through Jesus, also we have access by faith into this grace. Your faith is what accesses grace. A key accesses a door into a room. By your faith, you access grace, okay? Your faith is something that you have to do. People say, well, you know, we're saved by faith, not works. Did you know faith is called a work in the Bible? John 6, 28 and 29, they asked Jesus, what are the works that we must do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe, all right? Some people say, well, that means the work that God does. Well, let's just show you. Let's go to another letter written to Christians, and I'm going to read you what he says. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. It's kind of getting a little bit off topic, but... That's okay. It's worth looking at. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. This is uh, Paul, Silvanus and Timothy, but Paul, to the church of the Thessalonians. These are Christians. Here's what he says. We give thanks to God for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Faith's called a work, guys. I know you haven't heard that at church. At church, you're said... You're saved by grace through faith, not of works. Guess what? That's true, but there are different types of works, okay? Um, all right, let's answer some of these comments really quickly. Are you still saved if you live a life that doesn't completely honor God? That's a great question. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. Guess what I don't do 100% of the time? I don't always honor God. Now, I'm always trying to honor God, but I mess up, okay? Um, there's lots of times where I'm driving down the highway, and I break the speed limit, and I say, ah, oh, man, and guess what I do? Like we talked about earlier, I, first of all, stop breaking the speed limit. I slow down. I repent. I pray to God, please forgive me for that, okay? Um, 1 John, if you want to go look this up, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Actually, read down through chapter 2, the beginning of chapter 2. It says if you're walking in the light, okay, if you're doing your best to walk in the light, then the blood of Christ continually cleanses a Christian the first time your sins are forgiven. Okay, let me give you a, a timeline just to kind of clear this up. Let's say this is a person. It's not. It's a pen. This person's never heard the gospel. They hear the gospel. They say, wow, I believe that. What do I do? Okay, like Acts 16.30. What must I do to be saved? And they say, believe it. This guy, Mr. Penn, Mr. Penn says, I want to believe. Okay, okay. I teach this guy the gospel. He says, I believe it. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What do I do? I say, you repent of your sins. You confess Jesus. And you're baptized, okay? Mr. Penn says, I realize my sins have separated from me from God, that I'm going to be lost and go to hell if I don't obey what the Bible says. So he repents of his sins, okay? Then he, I say, do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? He says, yes, I do, according to Romans 10, 9, and 10. Then, according to Acts 2, 38, 
I would baptize Mr. Penn for the remission of sins. Okay, His sins are washed away in baptism. He rises. Now he's a Christian. His sins are washed away. Now, Mr. Penn sins. What does Mr. Penn need to do? He does not need to be baptized again. He does need to repent and pray, confess his sins to God. That's 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Okay. Uh, it, live with you. I'm not going to go live with you, dude. I'm not going to, I'm sorry. I'm not going to go live with you because it's going to get off topic. Um, you, I think you said that you were Muslim and you want to talk about that. We can talk about that a different time. I'm happy to talk with you. I have my, I have my own Quran right there. I've read it. I have all my notes in it, the th- reasons I don't believe it, um, et cetera. Um, okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I missed some of your guys' questions. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I would not recommend using tarot cards. Why? Because they're not and it's not, we're not told in the Bible that they are from God, okay? Um, faith without works is dead. That is exactly right. Let's look. Well, okay, am I getting off my topic? Okay, I think we already dealt with the fact that a person can lose their salvation, okay? It's very true you can lose your salvation. But let me reassure you, if you're following God to the best of your ability, if you're studying the Bible, God's Word, not a book written by some man, okay? Now, I'm not saying all books written by men are bad, okay? But until you know your Bible, you need to be very careful. Because if you don't know your Bible extremely well, you will be led away by false teachers writing books. I would tell you, I would say 99% of the books out there, well, maybe I'm not a mathematician, what am I doing? A lot of the books that are written by men teach a lot of truth, but have false doctrine mixed in, okay? You can be sure that this book has no false doctrine in it, unless it's saying, these guys taught this, it was false doctrine, okay? And it's being rebuked. The New Testament... Uh, in the Old Testament, the Bible combined, okay, that is the thing you need to be reading the most. That should be your daily reading material. If you read other things to supplement it, that's okay, but I'm going to tell you that's dangerous, okay? It's the same thing listening to, if you have false teachers, every church out there says they're a what? Bible-believing church. If you find a church that says we're a non-Bible-believing church, please take a picture of that and text it to me so I can save it. Every church says that they're a Bible-believing church. The problem is that a lot of people are deceived or mistaken or don't really know their Bibles that much. And because of that, they're teaching things that's contrary to what the Bible teaches. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, I can't... Uh, you're Please, one time, if you prove the truth, accept Christianity. That's fine. Me and you can talk separately, but we're not going to go live in front of all these people uh, and discuss it. We can uh, t- test on a mess. Yes, it has to be tested. Acts 17.11. Paul okay, goes to Berea. He just left Thessalonica. He was there for, I think, three weeks, and he was run off by these. They ran Paul out of town. Why? Because he was being nice? No, because he was controversial. Okay. In the New Testament, preaching was controversial. Why? Because you're telling people, hey, all you people are wrong. You need to change, or you're not going to be pleasing to God. That's controversial. I know when I get on here and tell you guys, hey, these churches you're a member of are not the New Testament church. You need to leave that church and go to the church you read about in the New Testament. That's controversial. It upsets people. I get a lot of mean messages. That's okay. I'm doing it because I love you, hoping one day you'll calm down from being mad at me and you'll search what the scriptures say. Acts 17, 11. Those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And it says why? Because they searched the scriptures daily to see if the things taught to them was true. Uh, is the third heaven real? Yes, it is. Second Corinthians. Uh, caught up into the third heaven. The Bible is used, uses heaven uh, as where the birds fly, the space, all right, where the stars are, and then actual spiritual where heaven would be. Okay, so... Um, Paul, I believe, was caught up to heaven, but he wasn't allowed to write about it. Um, Paul had a sort of unique, I don't expect to be caught up into that. Uh, Leviathan, Leviathan, Job 40, 41, I believe referencing a dinosaur. Um, anyway, okay. Um, I, I, where, I don't even know where you live. Send me a message, all right? That's the last time I'm going to respond to that one. Send me a message, and, uh, and we, can, we can talk about Islam. Um, and I'm not going to try to pronounce your name, but it ends with the number 786. We can talk about Islam uh, and Christianity and why I believe Christianity is the true religion uh, and Islam is not, with all due respect. I have love for you, uh, but I want to share the truth with you. Okay, now, I have no idea how much time we have left, but we're going to try to, now that we've addressed once saved, always saved, it is not biblical, okay? I will say this, the doctrine of you can never sin and be lost is unbiblical, okay? Okay. Um, Leviathan is Satan. I think he's probably saying Leviathan is a twisting serpent. Satan is a serpent. That's connecting two passages that are unrelated. Um, but I'd love to talk to your pastor if he wants to send me a message. That's great. Okay. So, once saved, always saved. If you're a Christian, you can leave, You can lose your salvation. Okay. Um, you can if you stop following God. One last uh, passage. We'll go to Revelation chapter 3. And... Uh, 
I love some of these comments. They make me chuckle. Revelation 3. Uh, look at verse, uh, let's see, verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Okay? This is written, this is a letter to a church in Laodicea in the first century. Real church. Laodicea was a rich city. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. This is talking about Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus Christ says this. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were hot or cold. Why? Verse 16. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Okay? He says that God is going to vomit somebody out of his mouth. Why? Because they weren't hot nor cold. Uh, let's see. I think in Revelation 2 it even says he'll take away your, your lampstand. Uh, let's see. Let me find out where that is. Uh, yeah, here we go. Revelation 2, 5. Remember, therefore, from which you have fallen. Okay, this is talking about church. Church has fallen. What do they need to do? Repent, okay, and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, do you think that's just figurative language? He's, they're not going to lose their salvation. The Bible says, Galatians 5, 4, you can fall from grace. Hebrews 3, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10. Uh, I, I, got, I could send you a whole list. If you want a picture of my notes, all right, Send me a message. I can send you a picture of all these notes that prove you can lose your salvation if you fall away from God, if you stop following God. Okay, that's going to end this portion. Now we're going to answer. I got 14 questions, okay? Um, okay, one of them I already addressed. Ephesians 4 5. What does it mean when it says there's one baptism? The word baptism simply means immersion, okay? Immersion. The word baptizo in Greek was not translated into immersion, which is what it should say. It was just basically some letters changed, and the word from Greek, baptizo, was made into baptize. Okay? It means immersion, okay? to dip, to plunge, to bury. All right? Now, Ephesians 4, you have a passage. Ephesians 4, 4 and 5 says this. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in all. We're given seven ones there. And the question is, why does it say one baptism? Because we know that there's baptism of John the Baptist, baptism, Matthew 3, 10, and 10 through 12, of fire and the Holy Spirit. There's a baptism of suffering, Jesus talked about. The word baptism, all it means is immersion. Okay, There's seven different times, uh, types of baptism referenced in the New Testament. So why does it say one baptism in Ephesians 4? The book of Ephesians was written about 64 to 65 around that time, uh, A.D., okay? That's, the church was established 30 to 33, depending on whether you start Jesus' birth at 4 B.C. That's completely um, a different topic for a different day. But by the time Ephesians is written, the other baptisms had been done away with, okay, or were to come in the future if you take baptism of fire being hell, then that would be later. At the time Ephesians 4 was written, Ephesians 4, 4 and 4, 5, the one baptism is water baptism, okay? People will say it's Holy Spirit baptism. Holy Spirit baptism was never a command. It was a promise. It was promised to the apostles, and then it also happened in Acts 2 with the apostles and Acts 10 with the Gentiles. It was a miracle to show God speaking in tongues, all right? There was also the gift of the Holy Spirit, which the apostles read chapter 8 of Acts and chapter 19, verses 1 through 6 of Acts. There was a gift of the Holy Spirit given by laying on the apostles' hands, Miracles, they spoke in tongues, etc. Um, if you have more questions about that, message me. Each one of these questions I could spend an hour talking about, but I'm going to try to give quick answers. Um, how does God speak to us today? I'm going to show you right here. Boom. He speaks to us through the Bible. That's a pretty simple one. If you uh, want more information, I can send you sermons on that. God speaks to you through the Bible, through His Spirit, which inspired the Word, Okay, the sword of the Spirit, is the Bible. Okay. Um, how does one truly come to know Jesus? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 8, 32. I think, sorry, I'm having a brain. John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. Okay. The Bible is the truth of God's word. If you want to know Jesus, you need to know his truth, which will set you free. How do you come to faith? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Um, so how do you truly come to know Jesus? You learn what the Bible teaches. Message me if you have that question. I can um, get you started on an online Bible study you can do at home by yourself. Do we need to keep the Sabbath? Oh boy, open up a can of worms. I'm going to show you scripture before I give you the answer because you're going to get upset at me. There are a lot of people out there that say we have to keep 
the Sabbath. Why do they say that? A lot of times they go to, um, uh, I will always be with Jesus, the Bible is a manual. That's right. The Bible, okay, this is your GPS for life, your gospel plan of salvation, your global positioning system, right, for your car. This is the GPS for your life, your spiritual life, okay? Um, a lot of people will say, Matthew 5, Jesus said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, and not a jot or tittle will pass away until all is fulfilled. Guess what Jesus did? Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses. How do I know that? Paul, in writing in Romans chapter 7, says this, the answer to keeping the Sabbath I do not believe you have to keep the Sabbath. You may believe you do. Let's hear me out before, okay? Romans 7, Paul is telling these uh, Jewish Christians, the ones who were under the law, Romans 7, Romans 7, chapter 1. Do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, the law of Moses, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. He talks about how Christians are not under the law of Moses anymore. Verse 4, Therefore, my brothers, you have become dead through the law. You've become dead to the law of Moses through the body of Christ. You've become dead to the law of Moses through the body of Christ. Well, what law of Moses is he talking about? Some people will say that's not the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath. Look at verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. The purpose of the law of Moses was to show people what sin was. Uh, to show how exceedingly sinful sin was. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law said, you shall not covet. Guess what one of the Ten Commandments is? You shall not covet, okay? Um, if you're trying to praise Allah in here, the Allah of Islam is not the one true God of the Bible. Uh, with all due respect, it's not. Um, so we're not going to have that in here. Um, the Bible teaches in Romans 7.1, this is written to Jews who know the law of Moses. Then, verse 4, you're dead to the law. Which law? Verse 7 of Romans 7, the law that says thou shalt not covet. That is one of the Ten Commandments. The Christian is not under the Ten Commandments, which uh, one of those is to keep the Sabbath. But hold on, don't get upset. All nine of the other Ten Commandments are restated in the New Testament. So, technically, the Christian is not under the Ten Commandments, but it is under nine of those ten which are restated in the New Testament. The Sabbath is not restated in the New Testament. Um... I think that's okay for now. If you if you want to, to do anything else, yes, the Most High Jesus. Okay, I'm okay with that. I'll praise the Most High Jesus. All right. Uh, let's see. I don't know how much time we got left. So the next question. Do I have to keep asking to be saved? Does God love me if I fall away from my faith? The first question. Do I have to keep asking to be saved? You never ask to be saved in the idea of praying a prayer. Um, I just heard somebody recently, a teacher say, uh, pray this prayer, or I think actually it was an NFL player, um, which he said, I accepted Jesus into my heart. Guys, this is so common. The Bible never teaches that. The Bible never teaches you accept Jesus into your heart, and then you're saved like that. That's not in the Bible. A man made that up, okay? We are in, uh, the no, the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible, okay? Do we need to say the sinner's prayer? No, okay? Here is what a person needs to do to be saved, Okay? Uh, why don't you just, here, I'll help you. If you think this room's poisoning us, then there. You're, I just took the poison away. You're not in the room anymore. Okay, so, do you have to keep asking to be saved? Here is what you do to be saved if you're a non-Christian, okay? Maybe you say, hey, I'm a Christian. I want you to listen. No, you don't have to accept Jesus. Then when you sin, you have to pray. Well, you, okay, let me, let me restate that, uh, T. McIntyre 14. This is what you need to do. You have to do what the things that Jesus said. If you say, I want to accept Jesus, well, you have to accept him on his terms. This is what the New Testament teaches. For a person to become a Christian, okay, you need to hear the gospel. If you've heard the gospel and you say, okay, I hear it, I believe it, then what do you have to do? Repent of your sins, okay, that's Acts 2.38. Confess that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans 10, 9 and 10 talks about that. And then you have to be baptized. I, this is another question we'll talk about. Do I have to keep asking to be saved? If you're already saved, okay, then you need to repent and pray, and that's what you need to do, and, and follow the Bible, try to grow as a Christian. If you, do, another question, does God love me if you fall away from your faith for some time, but you've already been saved? Absolutely, God loves you. Absolutely, okay? God loves everybody, okay? There are passages in the Old Testament, people will say, God doesn't love everybody, He hates sinners, okay? There are figures of speeches used in Psalms. 
God loves everybody, okay? It says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Guess what? That's every single one of us out there. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, all right? If you're out there and you say, I don't sin, I'm perfect, you're wrong. Sorry to break it to you. Every person on the face of this earth at some point in time has sinned and fall, and they still fall short, fall, current tense, Romans 3.23, of the glory of God, okay? You have to repent of your sins, confess Christ, that he is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9, and 10, and be baptized for, in order to obtain, the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2, 38. To have your sins washed away, Acts 22, 16. Um, so, if you've already fallen away and you were truly saved, uh, God does still love you, absolutely. Read uh, The Prodigal Son, the story of the prodigal son. And I want you to put yourself in the position of you being the prodigal son. That's what God wants you to do. God wants you to come home. Oh, great question. I'm adding that to the list. Did God hate Esau? Perfect, perfect, perfect. That's a beautiful question. Um, I'll answer that really quickly. Did God really hate Esau? Romans 9, 13. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, Esau have I hated. The older shall serve the younger. This is not talking about individual salvation. Calvinists will go to Romans 9, 13 and say, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Jacob is elect going to heaven no matter what he does. Esau is going to hell no matter what he does. That could not be further from the context. The context of Romans chapter 9 through 11 is that the Jews were God's chosen people, chosen as a nation to bring about Jesus Christ. Okay, It, isn't, it doesn't mean that all the Jews are going to be saved. Romans 11 says the only way all Israel will be saved is if they do not continue in unbelief. Okay, So God, when it says hate, first of all, it means loved less. But in Romans 9.13, it's not talking about the individual salvation, heaven or hell of Esau or Jacob. It's talking about how God can use Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to bring about Jesus Christ, who would then bring salvation to the Gentiles, not just the Jews. So God did not hate Esau the individual with regards to whether he'd go to heaven or not. Okay, God didn't like the things Esau did in his life. He committed a lot of sin, right? Which Jacob sinned too. Um, and if you say, well, Aaron, how do I know that that's not talking about individuals, but it's talking about nations? Number one, it is a quotation from Malachi chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, which is discussing nations. Jacob is used for the name of Israel, and Esau is used for Edom. Go look up Malachi chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and look that up. Um, the second way you know that it's not talking about individuals, it says in verse 12, the older shall serve the younger. The older is Esau. The younger is Jacob. Guess who never served Jacob? Esau never served Jacob. Okay, It's talking about the nations. If you go back to Genesis 25, 23, which is what that's a quote from, it says there are two nations in the womb, Jacob and Esau. Okay, Jacob, whether he goes to heaven or not, is determined completely on whether he chose to follow God. Esau, where he goes to heaven or not, is all on whether he chose to follow God. If you are out there, you have an individual responsibility to follow God and to follow the Bible. You are not predestined to heaven no matter what you do, as, as much as the Calvinists would want you to believe that, okay? Um, you are not totally depraved, okay? You are born sinless, not sinful, okay? You're born innocent. That's the way God created you. Jesus said, let the little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was not saying, let the little sinners come to me because that's what the kingdom of heaven is like, full of sinners. No. Children are innocent. When a baby dies, whether it's a miscarriage, whether it's an abortion, which is still a sin because it's murder, um, but if you're out there and you've had an abortion, you can be forgiven of it, okay? Don't, everybody has committed awful sins, okay? So, all right, sorry, I'm getting off on my tangent. Any sin you've committed, if you will repent, be baptized, have your sins washed away, and you confess Jesus before you're baptized, your sins will be washed away, you'll be a child of God, then from after that, you need to continue to try to walk in the light, okay? Jesus brought grace and truth and light to us. Uh, in Jesus was the light, okay? And he exposed darkness. You need to follow God's word, try to be grow in your Christian faith, uh, and continually repent of your sins and follow God, okay? Um, so yes, God loved Jacob more than Esau in the sense of nations, using them to bring Jesus Christ. That's the, the, the context of Romans 9. So he didn't hate Esau and send Esau to hell to, like predestination like Calvinists teach. That's completely wrong. In any Calvinist, or uh, I'm not trying to use Calvinists as a slang term or an insult. I'm just using it as the way they refer to themselves a lot of times. I'm happy to discuss anyone out there that, that wants to discuss that. 
Uh, the book of Romans is one of my favorites. Okay, do I have to keep asking to be saved? Um, no, but to be saved, you need to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Then you are saved. After you're saved initially, you repent and pray. Does God love you if you fall away? He always loves you, even whether you're a Christian or not. He loves everybody. Okay. Um, is baptism necessary? Yes. Okay. Let me give you three people that said it was other than Aaron. First of all, I'd like to give you uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay. And when I say Son of God, that's because he came to earth and took on flesh. In eternity, he was equal with God. And now he's equal with God. Okay. He said, glorify me with the glory that I had before. Okay. Mark 16, 16. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is what Jesus said. He who believes will be saved. No, that's not what it says. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Okay. I'll read the second part. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Two conditions in this verse to be saved. Belief and baptism. Okay. Here's another one. You don't want to be saved. Just don't believe. Okay. Okay, but you have to believe and be baptized to be saved. That's Jesus. Let me show you Acts 2.38. This is Peter, okay? <laughs> All right. If you want to talk, we can send me a message. All right. Acts 2.38. Read Acts chapter 2, the day the church is established. First time the gospel is preached, these people believe, and here's what Peter tells them. Look in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Believers, okay, these people believe already, and they say, what do we do? What's Peter tell them? Peter says this, then Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, okay? He says to people who believe already, if, if Mr. Penn, let's go back to Mr. Penn. Mr. Penn is on the day of Pentecost. He's a Jew, and he hears Peter preach. And he already believes in Jesus. And he asked Peter, Mr. Penn says, what do I do to be saved? What does Peter say? Mr. Penn, you need to repent and be baptized for the remission, for the forgiveness of your sins. Okay? So Jesus said you had to be baptized to be saved. Okay? Peter says you're baptized for the remission. That means forgiveness, removal of your sins. So Mr. Penn, I believe. Are my sins forgiven? Nope. I repent. Are my sins forgiven? Nope. I'm baptized. Are they forgiven? Now they're forgiven. Now Mr. Penn has to walk along and live a Christian life and repent of his sins. Uh, what about Paul? This is another one of the guys you probably heard of in the New Testament. So Jesus says you have to be baptized, be saved. Peter says you do. Paul. Paul, when he was converted, okay, Paul has already heard the gospel. He saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. I've never seen Jesus in person, so Paul had that one up on every single one of us today. He believed Jesus. He called him Lord. He obeyed Jesus. He was led to the street called Straight. He fasted and prayed for three days. Paul had heard, believed, repented, uh, confessed, fasted for three days. And this is what Paul said was preached to him by a gospel preacher, Ananias. Uh, Acts twenty two sixteen. And now, why are you waiting? This is to Paul. Hey, Paul, what are you waiting for? Arise, get up, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. These are all in the same Greek tense, which is aorist middle, which means they happen at the same time. Ananias says, get up, and then he gives you three things. Uh, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. All three in uh, middle aorist in Greek, which means they happen at the same time. Baptism is how you call on the name of the Lord. You don't call on the name of the Lord through a prayer. Um, we have a minute 18. You don't baptize babies. They have not sinned. Absolutely. You cannot baptize a baby. I mean, you can baptize one, but they don't need it, okay? If, if you were baptized as a baby, you were innocent anyway, no big deal. You need to be baptized as an adult because Jesus said a prerequisite to baptism was belief. You, don't, you can't believe when you're a baby. Peter, Acts 2, says repentance. You have to believe, and then if you believe, what do you do, Peter? Peter says you got to repent. If you won't repent, I can't baptize you. It won't do any good, okay? Um, what does the Bible say about LGBT? I want to know the information, an actual person who knows the Bible inside and out. Thank you very much. I love the Bible. Um, if you want some passages, I'll give you one. We have a minute left. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Paul gives a list of sins. In that list, he talks about homosexuality, but here's the key. In verse 11, he gives a list in verses 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, verse 10. He gives an explanation of this list of sins 
that will keep people out of heaven. But then he says this, and if you are in the LGBT community, homosexuality, you can come out of that. Listen to this. And such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. No matter what you're struggling with, you can come out of it and be a New Testament Christian. The Church of Christ salutes you. Romans 16, 16. Have a good day.